Hey, friends and clever listeners, guess what? We are almost at 200 episodes. Can you believe how old we are? That means we have hundreds of episodes of interesting stories from fascinating people. So go to your podcast app or cleverpodcast.com slash episodes dash list and scroll through all of them to pick out the ones you haven't heard yet. It also means that we're getting ready for a big celebration. More on that later. Stay tuned. In the meantime, we're queuing up a few extra memorable episodes from the archive to commemorate this upcoming milestone. So if you have any favorites or requests, be sure to let us know. Is there someone special you'd really love to hear from for episode 200? Or maybe there's an interview from a while back that has really stuck with you. We live for this, so please leave us a comment on Instagram, or even better, email us a voice memo. You know we love to hear your voice. Send it to hello at cleverpodcast.com. And now, please enjoy this encore presentation. When design thinking can run a company, you can actually become one of the most valuable companies in the world. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. And today I'm talking to designer and CEO and co-founder of Airbnb, Brian Chesky. Brian grew up in Niska Uni, New York, being obsessed with both hockey and Norman Rockwell. A self-described existential and peculiar kid, he says no one, not even he, would have pegged him as the future CEO of a global company, a hint at everyone's hidden potential. At 17, he had a moment of clarity and made a personal decision to always be happy. And, in doing so, gave himself permission to pursue his art and design dreams, which led him to Rhode Island School of Design, where he studied industrial design and met Joe Gebbia, his future partner in Airbnb. After several years of soaring success in Silicon Valley and the globe, Airbnb, having suffered dramatic losses due to the coronavirus pandemic, is getting back to its creative values and working toward meaningful and useful contribution in the modern crisis of connection. Brian champions the ideas of design driving business from C-suites and boardrooms and leading with compassion and curiosity. It's an inspiring, refreshing, and hopeful talk. Here's Brian. My name is Brian Chesky. I am the co-founder and CEO of Airbnb. I live in San Francisco, and the reason I do this is because I couldn't afford to pay rent. Necessity is the mother of invention, right? Yes, it is. I did not think this would be the journey we would be on. Speaking of mothers, I always like to go all the way back to the very beginning, maybe not the womb, but the formative years, because I like to understand uh, how you got started on your journey here. And so can you talk about your childhood? You were born in upstate New York, right? Tell me about your hometown, your family dynamic, and the types of things that captured your young imagination. Yeah, I was born in Schenectady, New York. Um, and I, I grew up in this small town called Niskiuna, which I believe is the same town your last guest grew up in. I kind of had like three or four lives as a kid, different things. You know, growing up, I was very, very interested in, in art and design. But the my, my kind of my my very first life was as a hockey player because my my uh, my dad was very interested in athletics and got me involved in ice hockey, and that became like a huge part of my life. And I ended up going to this like private school for 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 hockey, and it like completely consumed me. But growing up, I had a a deeper passion, and that deeper passion was art. I just had this like obsessive interest in it and in design too. I liked uh, illustration. I was a huge fan of Norman Rockwell and the Norman Rockwell um, had a museum in Stockbridge. And so my parents used to take me to the museum and they just kind of like literally dropped me off. I mean, they wouldn't leave me there, but they would be there with me and I'd just be reproducing the paintings and the drawings. And I had this obsessive interest in Norman Rockwell and other artists and designers. Um, when I was a kid, I actually asked Santa for poorly designed toys so I could redesign them. <laughs> Um, so at the time it seemed totally normal. Like I would, I, I would get like a new pair of, I remember like the Bo Jackson CrossFit or whatever, or even the ones I didn't own. And I would try to redesign the shoes and I would like make hundreds and hundreds of drawings of like shoes. I think I was like 11 or 12 years old. I was at a friend's house, this kid, Jeff, 
And his parents were redesigning their backyard. They were they hired a landscape architect and they were designing a deck. And they had all these architectural drawings and they had, a, you know, like a compass and a protractor and a, and a drawing like kind of T-square and all these tools I thought were like the coolest things. They look like surgical tools. And so I suddenly got into randomly landscape architecture when I was like 10 or 11. I tried to convince my neighbors to like redesign their backyards because I thought, well, I can, I can be enterprising. And that didn't work out so well. Um, no one hired me to, to redesign the decks in their backyards. My interests grew um, in all different areas including, um, I actually remember the first time I was in an airplane, I was seven. My parents took me to St. Louis. And at the time, this didn't seem peculiar, but in hindsight, it was. What I was most interested in when I was seven in the city of St. Louis was trying to reimagine the design of the city. And I don't know why, it just seemed natural at the time. In hindsight, it's, it's a peculiar thing to want to do that at seven. But I remember like trying to understand the city like layout and like understand like how the urban area was interesting. Later on, like not actually not much later, I convinced my my dad to buy some Disney stock. You know, we couldn't buy a lot. But if you buy, if you became a shareholder at Disney, you could get this thing called the annual report. And the annual reports, there used to be these beautiful magazines with these paintings of theme parks. And I became like obsessive about like trying to reimagine the design of theme parks. And I just liked like redesigning and reimagining things. So I was really interested in design, really interested in art. But I'm, I'm, I went to this private school. When I was 16 years old, I ended up going to this uh, public school, Miskina High School. And I meet a teacher who kind of, I guess, I guess she kind of changed my life. Her name was Miss Williams. You know, I was really interested in art and design. And unbeknownst to me, she entered my work into an art competition. And I ended up having my artwork displayed in the Rotunda Gallery. But she actually, and a teacher after her as well, who took over the apartment, they really inspired me that I could actually like go to design school because before that, it never occurred to me that I could be a designer. I started like obsessively working my portfolio. I got a lot of accolades for it. And a thought occurred to me. I was, I remember I was 17 years old and I had this like great awakening and the awakening was I can just choose to be happy the rest of my life. And it was a crazy thing that you could just choose to be happy. And the way you could choose to be happy was just decide to do what you love. And if you just did that and you focused on it, that maybe you can make money on it. And if, and therefore you'd be happy, right? Like most children spend their childhood doing things against their will. I mean, that's essentially what childhood is mostly like child children don't choose to go to school. They don't choose to be in the most subjects. They don't choose to go through standardized testing. Half the sports you play, you didn't even choose to play those. So, so much of what a child does is kind of perfunctory. And then suddenly like you, you know, like there's this moment where if you have that right privilege, you can like get off that track and some other track. And it was, that was the moment when I thought like, I, I want to go to design school. And at the time, you know, RISD, uh, Rhode Island School Design was really one of the preeminent design schools. It really is still today in the world. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I thought I wanted to be an artist and designer. And that was the moment that I applied. I got to, went to RISD and I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to go there. And so that was the first chapter of my journey into RISD. Well, I want to hear all about your RISD years, but I need to back up a little bit because that's an astounding awakening for a 17-year-old. A lot of kids are just trying to have a good time at that point. Like, that's an existential question to arrive at for yourself. Did your parents... I was very existential. Were you? (laughs) (laughs) I guess I was. Yeah. Yeah, I was very existential even back then. Did your parents support this wholeheartedly? Well... Considering my mom's going to probably listen to this podcast, um, <laughs> I got to think about what I'll say. Here's what I'd say, and I, I think they would agree with this. I think my parents wanted to be supportive, and they found a way to be supportive. But let me put it to you this way: my my mom and dad were social workers, so I, I kind of came from like a fairly normal, typical American background. My parents are social workers, and my mom. I remember her as a kid telling me, "I chose a job for the love, and I made no money. You should choose a job that pays you a lot of money." And so one day, I tell my mom, "Mom, I." I'm going to go to art school. And she said, oh, my God, you actually managed to pick the only job that will pay you less than a social worker. In fact, you're going to find a way to make no money. And I said, no, mom, I'm going to make money. She says, well, if you go to art school, you need to kind of make me a promise. And I said, what's that promise? She says, promise me, this is my, her, my dad, that one day that you will graduate college, that you will get a job. And I said, I promise 
I'll get a job. She said, you have to also have to promise you're not going to like live in our basement. And I said, I'm not going to live in your basement. And they said, finally, you, the job has to be a real job with health insurance. <laughs> and I said, fine, I'm going to graduate RISD. I'm not going to live in your basement. And I'm going to get a job with health insurance, which is weirdly all full circle because here I am 38 years old, more than 20 years later. And because of random circumstances like COVID, I am back to living with my mom. But I think I've made some progress, but that, that's the weird part. <laughs> but um, they were like cautiously supportive, I guess. I don't think it was the default path, right? Being an artist wasn't the default path growing up. Being a designer wasn't the default path. And being an entrepreneur, not only was being an entrepreneur not the default path, it was inconceivable that was even an available option. The only entrepreneur I knew was like Bob from Bob's Pizza, and I didn't want to have a pizza shop. So just in, these two things didn't seem like available options. And unfortunately, the arts are, they're not as valued as the sciences. I mean, just generally in most cultures. And so I think that's very easy to overlook. And I, I, maybe the last thing I'll just say is what an irony my life has been. Because the major fear that parents have of kids going to art and design school, they won't make any money. Mm -hmm. What a weird turn of events for me. And I think there's a lesson there. And the problem is that I think people have a lot of trepidation of people going to art and design school because they don't know how it's going to be valuable. But the most important thing that I learned at RISD, and I'm sure you did too, wasn't how to make something, it was how to think about something. And that was that thinking could transcend to anything. It could transcend to running a global organization. Oh, th absolutely. I agree with you 100%. And I remember at RISD, one other thing. They, they, there was, uh, you may have remember this. There was this whole thing at RISD, getting design in the boardroom, like how to have a voice in the boardroom and what if like a, how to get design and use that at the table and design the boardroom. And I think that like my co-founder and I thought to ourselves, why should design be in the boardroom? Why doesn't design just run the boardroom? Right. Design is not a voice in the boardroom. Design is the framework from which you operate the whole business. I think we unfortunately lost a lesson in the lesson of Apple. Because if you think about a company that is incredibly design driven, it's Apple. Mm -hmm. And the unfortunate thing is we lost this lesson. And the reason we, we lost a lesson, here's the lesson. Steve Jobs was one of the most iconic founders of the last 50 years. And we use words to describe him. And the words are words like visionary. That is true that he was a visionary, but we tend to use these labels for things for which we don't understand. If I could just describe Steve, he came from a school thought and that school thought was design. He was an artist and designer at heart, I think, for, for as much as anything. And I think that what happens at the ultimate when design thinking can run a company, you can actually become one of the most valuable companies in the world. And I, I think that's one of the great lessons. But of course, we don't call him a designer or think of what Apple did as you know, design thinking, or, we, or at least we, don't, we, we call it visionary and we use these other words for which, well, you can't fall in the footsteps of a visionary. So, but of course, there's a method, there's a process. And so I think it is actually something that other companies can adopt. No, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I had a great conversation with Eric Quint, the chief design officer of 3M about this. Anyway, oh, we could talk for hours about this, but I've got a lot more questions <laughs> for, for you. I do agree with you. Like when I went to RISD, I learned a lot about making furniture, but what I really learned was how to think about anything and take something from zero to this. I learned how to right. build anything. And that means a platform, anything that doesn't exist yet, I can work it out. That creative thinking, I think, is so valuable. And it's exactly what we need more of in the world right now in terms of all of these like really complex challenges that we were being confronted with. But I want to go back to RISD as you're learning how to think. What else are you learning? Like, how is your personal development? What's the course of that trajectory? Oh, man. RISD was such a crazy period of time for me because I didn't really fit in in high school. And I feel like... Were you too Rizzi existential? Were you, were you pondering Probably. the, the, yeah, the too philosophical? Exactly. And, <laughs> yeah. I, and, I, and I got to RISD where I think people who didn't fit in could go and collectively kind of fit in. And I didn't even feel like I quite fit in there. I had all these like varied interests. I ended up playing on the RISD hockey team mm -hmm. and ended up like kind of running it. That was probably... 
honestly, like one of the most important things that happened at RISD is I played on the hockey team and I ran this like hockey team, which was this like club hockey program. And that's actually how I met my co-founder at RISD because I was running the hockey program and he was running the basketball program. He had created the basketball program and we had the biggest marketing challenge anyone probably in the history of the universe has ever had. How do you get an art student to come to a sports game? It's basically an almost impossible thing to do. And so that was our first foray. But that was like really important because I'd never run anything in my life. And this was like a little club and it was really cool. The other thing is at RISD, I, when I went to Jeff Zion, they had a, a exchange program or a product development program with MIT. So I ended up spending a semester um, doing a product development program um, that the design department had with MIT. And suddenly that exposed me to a whole new world of engineering. And we started working with mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. And eventually, a little after, I started working with software engineers. And that became really, really important because, in fact, I think it turns out a designer can run a very large company, but it's extremely hard for a designer to run a large company that does not work with technology. In fact, think to yourself, what are designers who run big companies? Most of the people you can name are fashion designers, mm-hmm. right? And that's because fashion is not at the intersection of as high technology, certainly not working with electrical, chemical, mechanical engineers. And then Silicon Valley is almost entirely dominated by engineers. But our experience working with like engineers helped. And I started just, it started just occurring to me that I mean, maybe, maybe here's the thing. Mm-hmm. I generally don't think design is very respected in the business world um, still. And when I went to RISD, I felt like design was getting a resurgence. I don't know if you remember the late 90s, like before Apple was probably Target, right? Remember Target mm-hmm. was like bringing design to the like, kind of middle class mm-hmm. and all these people and Michael Graves. And then when we got to RISD, I think like the iMac had just come out and then the iPod was there. And design has had this amazing wave. But I got to tell you, like looking at major companies in the world, take every Fortune 500 company and ask how many of the CEOs are have a design background or creative. Okay, fine. Now look at their board of directors. How many people on the board of directors of any of these companies have anyone with a creative background? Okay, now look at the direct reports of the CEO of the top 500 companies world. How many of them have a designer or a creative person on the senior management team? In fact, if you can take the Fortune 500 and you can find like five or 10 companies that fall any of those characteristics, I mean, you probably surprise me. And so what ends up happening is there's two types of people that never take over the CEO job, or at least they never used to in a company, the head of design, the head of HR, right? CFOs become CEOs, Mm -hmm. um, COOs become CEOs, engineers become CEOs, all these things. And it always felt like, but wait a second, some of the most successful companies ever have had people that embrace design. And so I've kind of felt like, Whatever we can do, you know, I'm not here to like advance necessarily thinking around design, you know, like, I mean, there's a lot of designers you can bring on, but what I want to do is be a champion for it Mm -hmm. to get designers into the boardroom, to get designers in the executive team, to really get them at the table, because I think it's such an underutilized skill. And I think some of the greatest challenge that humanity is thinking, it's going to require imagination. In fact, Albert Einstein himself says, logic can take you from A to Z, but imagination can take you anywhere. And I think there's something about the creative process. Corporations utilize the scientific method, and I think they need to start utilizing more of the creative process and realize that these two things can coexist. And so this is kind of one of the things I've been like increasingly obsessive about beyond just what Airbnb is doing is how do we make sure that like large corporations and like governments in other areas Mm -hmm. really utilize design thinking at a time when schools and others are probably investing even less in educating kids about design and art. Here, here. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, that's one of the reasons I started this podcast is to just kind of help expand our cultural definition of what design is yes. and the value that it brings. And I also think that when the world is so topsy turvy as it is right now and nothing is predictable and there's all this uncertainty, the only method of value is the creative process because yeah. it's the, it's the only, um, agile fluid way you're going to be able to work with things that aren't knowns. The scientific process, the mathematical process, the engineering process all require some knowns and creativity yes. is a, adapt and comfortable when working with unknowns. And I love that. That's a great description of it. 
And so, I mean, I think you sort of told me, but I'd like to know in the early years of Airbnb and you grew into your role as CEO, did you always have a gift for leadership? And I'm really interested, the child of two social workers who went to design school, where did you get your entrepreneurial gifts from and your management style? And what was that feeling like for you? Were you just like, was your nervous system exploding or were you like just surfing it gracefully? I think that if you would ask my high school teachers and you said, one of these people is going to run a very, very large company, which one of is, is it? I don't think I'd be the top of the list. In fact, I don't even know if I'd be on the list. I think if you said the same thing in college, I don't even know if I'd be on that list. I don't know where it all came from. But one of the things I've learned is that if you had met me, I, I think when I was 14, 15, 16, I don't think you would have seen it. Maybe, maybe people would have. I don't, I don't think you would have. And so maybe there's a lesson here, which is that we all have, or many of us have, unknown potential. Mm. And that I often tell kids, do not listen to your parents. It's one of the most important advice I can ever give a kid is not to listen to their parents. I don't mean about ethics and uh, principles and how to live your life, but I mean for job career advice. I think your parents love you. They want to protect you. But of course, sometimes they, they can't even see beyond their own image and limitations of what is possible for you. And I think that we can, and I think parents is a proxy for anyone. Like, I think that we all have so much more potential to be leaders than we give ourselves credit for. And I was always afraid. I didn't think I had the leadership capabilities. I didn't think I could like be assertive enough or creative enough. And I wasn't like the popular kid in school. I was kind of the peculiar kid or something. I was, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I certainly was, um, I don't know what I was. You were the hockey and, um, philosopher. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I don't know what I was. And what I had was conviction even back then. And I think so much of leadership is conviction. Hmm. It's just like, it's so much of leadership's conviction. You know, you ever like get, you, like, I'll give you a metaphor. Imagine there's like, a, we're in a car, like you and I and like two more people. And we're trying to like, we're trying to get to like, like Tahoe and we're a car and we don't have a map on us. And then I say a suggestion like, oh, I don't know, maybe it's like here on the left. And you're like, okay, it's here on the left. And maybe we go on this like highway. But what if I were to tell you, like, I'm so certain that it's this way. I feel it. I can tell you. And like, you suddenly, you might take a leap. Now, I might be wrong. And so you got to be careful when you have conviction that you could actually lead people astray. But when you truly believe something, I think a lot of people, they're too shy and they're not shameless enough about actually like pursuing something. And I think conviction is like quite important for, for, for leadership and having like clear principles and working backwards from like a, a real problem. So that's kind of maybe one thing. Another thing is I just had a, a divergent interest. I liked art. I liked, I was interested in science or in athletics or just in all these different areas. And, you know, one of the things that design school in RISD did is they tried to, I did feel like RISD tried to narrow you into a specialization. And maybe there's a good reason for that because they want you to become employable. But to actually be a leader, you need to be the opposite in many ways of a specialist, that you need to be a generalist. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to balance like so many different functions, whether it's design or operations or marketing or software engineering or policy and like kind of just human nature with leadership. And there's so many things you have to do. But the most important thing that I, you know, leadership can be learned. And I think the most important thing I learned at RISD was how to learn. Mm -hmm. And I think how you learn is you have to be deeply, deeply curious. What's the Pablo Picasso saying? Like, all children are born artists. The challenges remain artists as one grows up. And the older you get, the stronger the wind gets. And it's always in your face. So I think mm -hmm. the key is, like, to continue to have that, like, voracious curiosity. And here I was, somebody who knew nothing about technology, nothing about Silicon Valley, nothing about business, and nothing about leadership. And how do you go from that without any resources and actually end up running a company that, you know, has like hundreds of millions of customers, every single thing can be learned. You don't have to learn how to become something. You only have to learn what you have to do to get to tomorrow. That's all you got to do. How, what do I need to learn to get till tomorrow? And you take everything one day at a time, whether it's a crisis or it's just a long journey. And we tend to obviously overestimate what we can do in a year, but we always underestimate what we can do in 10 years. And that's what it's been for me. And I was basically shameless. The way I was shameless was like, and I was like this, my co-founder, you know, we realized that the way to learn something was to go to the source 
and the source might be a material or might be meeting somebody. And instead of spending time trying to read every subject, you'd spend time trying to go to the definitive source of something. This is the kind of thing what designers try to do. And you try to like interview them, you observe, you see, you distill something to its underlying principles. And from that, you can almost do anything. And I think that so many people are limited by dogma and they're limited by th- thinking via analogy. Something is the way it is. Right. And so therefore it must be. And what if we just assume that every single thing is the way it is because somebody made a decision before you and you can change that decision because maybe the circumstances are different. Right. That if you truly understand you have technology, we have tools no one else had. And because of that, almost anything can be rethought. Almost anything can be changed. And just start with the very basic first principles of like what something could be. And you can work backwards from a real vision. It's, it's really, I think almost anything could be rethought. Now we don't all have the canvas, but theoretically anything can be redesigned. Every, anything in the world. Everything in the world is designed. Every single thing that's not that's true. nature. Everything that's man-made has been designed either intentionally or unintentionally. And that... And I think mostly unintentionally. I think one of the things I've noticed is that people tend not to have a great understanding of design Mm -hmm. because they think it's aesthetics and patina Mm -hmm. and it's beauty and it's ornamentation. And they kind of put it on like, like a secondary level of importance. And then they describe what's really important. And they're basically describing design, right? (laughs) Um, But they don't know they're describing design, (laughs) you know, design, like how it works and how it fits together and like what it's meant to be. And it's like, okay. So that in many ways is design. So I'm going to fast forward here to 2015 when Time Magazine names you one of the 100 most influential people in the world. I mean, hot damn. (laughs) I guess. um, That was, yeah, that was weird. (laughs) What does that do to somebody's psyche? Well, it depends on who you are. Um, I'm really, I'm really glad you had social worker parents because I feel like they probably kept you kind of grounded. Let me get to I remember around 2011, someone said, just be careful who your friends are because you could lose your shit on this ride. And uh, I've seen a lot of people go on a journey like mine and basically lose their shit, just like kind of lose their mind, especially when you're like a tech founder and you can make something and then hundreds of millions of people use it. It can get really disorienting and you can start to basically lose your mind. Okay, here, here's here's one thing I've learned. I guess there's a lot of things I've learned. <laughs> when you see somebody like incredibly successful, incredibly powerful, you know, I've had the great fortune to get to know uh, President Obama is like, like somebody I talk to every couple of weeks and he, he became like an informal advisor or Warren Buffett and all these people. And when I was a kid, if you told me about these people, I would have imagined to get to that level or to like to, to think at that level. It's like you would be like climbing like 100 stories. Right. And it's such a long road. And then the more successful you get, and I'm I'm like nowhere near that, but like you start to realize you spend all these years, you make all this ground, and then you suddenly look down and you're only like three feet off the ground. You're not a hundred feet off the ground. You're not 10 stories off the ground. I guess what I mean by that is I think that one of the things I noticed and the reason you bring up fortune, uh, the time 100 is uh, here's what I've learned about people. And this is, I think, a non-obvious statement. People are 99% the same, every single person. And by the way, that is genetically true. And we spend so much time spending a focus on the 1% that makes us different. And yeah, those 1% differences are really important. And we need to understand those 1% differences and accept those 1% differences. And whether this these 1% differences are background or heritage or culture or even success, it's really important to remember that if we are 99% the same, then suddenly how could you be anything more than like 1% different than you used to be? And if you kind of have that thinking, that kind of stuff like helps you not really lose your mind. And that, you know, like you could be a hundred times more famous than somebody or 10,000 times wealthier, but you're still 99% the same as them. The thing that's changed is society. It's the thing that's changed is the people around you, mm-hmm. the orientation around you, but you're, you're mostly still the same person. And that is, I think true, whether I, meet just anyone, whether they're well-known or not well-known. And so that, you know, I think can be disorienting when you go to those kinds of things. 
but people are really 99% the same. And I think it's kind of weird that sometimes you have to go on the ride I've gone through to like be reminded of that. And also I've traveled around the world, right? Like a oh, hundred cities or whatever, just on Airbnb. And I'm kind of consistently reminded of that simple truth that people are 99% the same. Well, that common humanity is, it's a core aspect of the business, that idea of connection and belonging and uniting in this common humanity um, for the sake of yourself and for the sake of others. Yeah. And I think, I think we're kind of tribal by nature. That's the other thing about humans. Mm -hmm. And so on the one hand, that's good. But the problem with being super tribal is you tend to think people in another tribe are so different from you. You tend to put up kind of walls between you and other people. I think that if we could I kind of, yeah, I think if we can just help people walk in each other's shoes, that would be the ultimate form of kind of unity and reconciliation is to walk in each other's shoes. People think like you have to be convinced of something and then you join the community. You have to join the community to be convinced of something. It actually goes the other way around. You have to walk in someone's shoes first. You can't like be convinced of something and then walk in their shoes. And it's hard to do. I mean, that's a metaphor. But. <laughs> well, the other thing that came to mind as you were describing that sort of hundred story climb was that we also kind of think of that the wrong way. It's not climbing up to this flagpole like perch where you don't really have anywhere to go and it's really precarious. It's more like building the ground underneath you. So you just, oh, I like that. it's not just you it's, and it's you and everybody that's sort of working together is building this higher land mass. So you still yeah. have a, I love that. yeah. And it's stable. It's not tippy. It's not precarious. But I do think some people seek I love that. that kind of success because they're hoping they'll be a different person when they achieve and by that. by the way, I think success generally oftentimes makes people unhappy. And the reason I think success makes you unhappy is because the model of success is this idea of climbing. And when you climb and you grow, what ends up actually happening is you actually get disconnected. And I think that like not to like try to presume what happiness is, but I think so much of happiness is connection. Yes. It's about being a part of something and that everything's connected. Everyone's connected. We're part of that connection. And the problem with a lot of classical ideas of success, it's not about arrogance or narcissism when you're trying to climb and think you're better than somebody. It's actually just disconnection. And it's, it's like, you're the one that's going to make yourself unhappy. By the way, that's even a lesson I've even had to learn a little bit because like, one of the lessons I learned with classical success, because you can define it however you want, but however, is that there's a major risk of um, disconnection and loneliness. And you that you find out as you get more successful that you can become more isolated. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the problem. This is why I think people like can kind of with success get disoriented, is if you're not careful, you get disconnected, you get isolated, and then that actually can cause some really, really big problems. And I think so much of what we need to do is just kind of keep people connected. And you need to be connected to yourself, to your friends, to your family, and to something bigger than yourself. And I think today, it's harder than ever, right? right. We're probably living in the loneliest time in human history, mm -hmm. and probably only going to get worse. But I said, but um, there's hope we can, we can, we can fight against that. Yes, there is hope. Thank you. Um, and, I, you know, this pandemic has really hit that point home really hard for me. I value connection more than almost anything. And so what's it done for you? What's this last couple months been for you? It's been difficult. I don't have a partner or anything like that. So I haven't had, you know, hugs and normal things that just sort of soothe your nervous system and make you feel like connected to something. I've sort of ramped up this digital media thing that I do here into other areas of content that I feel like is really meaningful. I've sort of leaned into the meaningful part of my work and I've answered a call. I was offered a job to teach at RISD and I feel really That's so awesome. like that is a calling that I need to go and pursue. And so I'm leaving everything and moving across country in a pandemic to go be part of that community because I want that connection. You've hit on something really important. Right now, especially, I think this is a particularly hard time for everyone. Um, this is an incredibly isolating time. And the, the thing about loneliness is when I hear the word loneliness, like I would think of like someone who's much older, maybe their significant other died or they're, you know, living alone. And the thing about loneliness is it's actually part of the human condition. 
that every one of us has feelings of loneliness, but we generally don't call it loneliness. We just, we feel this thing and we don't know what to label it, but what we're really describing is disconnection that we're feeling a lack of some kind of connection. And the thing about loneliness and disconnection is the more disconnected and lonely you get, often the less you desire connection. You tend to push things away and you don't even realize it's happening. It's true. So yeah. it, it kind of like compounds itself. And in this time, like now, it's even harder to meet new people. How does one meet somebody right now? You know, it's like if you can't even physically meet them. And mm -hmm. so people's bubbles are getting smaller. The worlds are getting smaller. And many of the kind of institutions that connected people are going away. I think the problem with modern life, and maybe here's the challenge of the designer, is do you ever see the movie, the Pixar movie, WALL-E? No, I never saw it. Sorry. Well, it's a really interesting movie where the basic premise is that like it extrapolates many years from now. Humans have basically destroyed the earth. And they're, so they had to move into the orbit. They live in these like self-driving pods glued to screens, but disconnected from one another. And it's just this ultimate industrialization. If you were to take that to its kind of natural evolution, that's what you would end up with. And so I think what's happened is we've made all these tools and we've had all this progress. But one of the things about progress is progress often makes things efficient. One of the things that's inefficient is human connection. It's so, so one true. way to make something efficient is to design human connection out of it, not realizing we're doing that. Right. So maybe it's you used to go to the, see the bank tower. Now you're doing it online. And that's like, a, that seems like a step forward. We're not going to go shop or it's going to come to our front door. And every one of these very small decisions where like, we're not going to do this, we're going to do that. And it's just a thousand small design choices. One day we wake up and we live in a world that we're just not as happy with the world we're living in. Mm -hmm. And so I think the challenge of designer is not just to design an object, but for us to, I think, think more broadly about like, what kind of world do we want to live in? And so just for example, if you look at like how humans evolved, you know, the modern human is about what, like, just to give you some weird, like sets about 300,000 years old, right? Mm -hmm. uh, homo sapiens. We've been farming for 10,000 years. And so that means for most of our existence, we were hunter gatherers and we lived in tribes of hundred, 150 people. And there's an old saying, it takes a village to raise somebody. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because it used to actually take a village to raise somebody. There wasn't 50,000 years ago, blue cross, blue shield and like an ambulance and all this stuff. Like you, you actually, and I think the challenge is we talk about essential business right now in this crisis. There are actually things that are really essential, like love and connection. And I, and I think that these are things that are having trouble fitting into the society that we've designed. And therein lies one of the challenges for designers. You know, you know, obviously, when I was at RISD, one of the things we talked a lot about was green design and the challenges of uh, production on our planet. Mm -hmm. That was, you consider that environmental. Well, I also think there's major challenges economically and socially. And I think we, ideally, we as designers can help think through all of these challenges. Mm -hmm. But the ultimate challenge for us as designers is that we also have to get into the boardrooms. We can't, you know, we can't just sit at the periphery of the boardroom to be able to make that change. Otherwise, we're trying to change the world on, on the margins. And, right. I, and I think we have to get into the heart of the machine and help redesign it. You got to infiltrate and get in, yeah, on the inside and actually redesign it, unscrew a few of those bolts and, and move them. Yeah. I, I do think that we need to approach all aspects of the economy and society from a position of a harmony and empathy and compassion. I wanted to ask you about, I mean, you've already talked really eloquently about walking in other people's shoes and designing for connection. It's so true that in the name of efficiency and productivity, we've optimized things so that humans don't really get to enjoy them anymore. We just get to yeah. work harder. But connection is sort of a, like creativity, connection Connection takes time and repetition and unfettered, unpressured ability to, you know, get to know people or go through experiences together. And you can't really design that but you can design to allow for that. Yeah. And you've done a lot of work doing that, both with Airbnb and the way that you run the company. Recently, I know, you know, this pandemic has done a number on a lot of people and you had to lay off 25% of the workforce and that must have been really hard. 
Um, but you also garnered a bunch of respect for the way in which you handled it. And I think empathic and compassionate leadership is so important if we're going to build or rebuild or make a better new normal. I totally agree. And I think people are empathic and compassionate at their, at their root, right? Yeah. You say, oh, they're not. And then, and then suddenly like, like I like business leaders, not compassionate, but then suddenly a tragedy happens to their family and they have to tend to it. And you see a different side of that. Yeah. Right? Like we always see other sides to people. Of course they're not what they are. The problem is dogma. It's like much of the roots of how a corporation is run is the industrial revolution, a factory owner mm -hmm. managing a factory that's kind of a lot of the roots of where the modern corporation comes from. And I think there really fundamentally is and has to be a different way to run a company. I think that the leaders, it's not that they're not compassionate. It's just that they have defaulted um, towards a, a, sometimes a different orientation that you have to push against. You're like, for example, let's take the, like a layoff. Like mm -hmm. I don't, that sure there's a way to do a layoff well, but there's a way to try to do your very best and to do your very best, you got to try to not take something out of the box. One of the things they say with a layoff, I mean, I'll give you a couple examples mm -hmm. of things that we tried to push against. The first thing is leaders, when they know they're having to make a hard decision, they try to avoid their employees and they try to be careful about what they say. I said to myself, like in our team, like we're going to basically like every single week, tell the employees just how bad it is. They're free to give us ideas. And we're looking at the camera every week it was on Zoom or, you know, because there's can physically be with them. We're going to, we're going to answer every single question they have. We're going to tell them how bad it is. When we had to make the decision, we went through the actual principles and the decision-making that we, we, we actually uncovered. And we made a decision to do absolutely as much as we could for every person, at least as much far as we could go. We did a couple of things that like companies haven't done too much before. I'll just give you two examples. The first thing we said is, a lot of people focus on severance when you you have to lay people off. And, you know, we certainly did a lot there. We tried to. But the other thing is we said what people need more than that is they need another job. And so we took a portion of our recruiting team and we dedicated it. And we said, let's dedicate a portion of recruiting team for the rest of the year. This is an idea my co-founder Joe had, creating an internal placement firm to help them find jobs elsewhere. And then we did something else that was even easier to do and even more profound. We allowed everyone who was being laid off to post their profiles on a public directory. And we created this thing called an alumni directory. And we said, anyone who's being laid off, you can opt into it and we'll share your LinkedIn. We'll post it publicly. And we created this uh, uh, alumni directory, a thousand people opted into alumni directory. So we ended up just publishing all the profiles saying, these are the people that have been laid off. If you're interested in contacting them, 500,000 people visited their profiles, Wow, 500,000. And I don't know how many people found jobs, but you you would hope that that would have yielded some opportunities that wouldn't have otherwise happened. Mm -hmm. That that was free. Now, why don't business leaders do stuff like that? Well, there's probably a couple of reasons. The main reason they haven't thought about it and they don't really think like, how could we help them? Like, let's actually like the designer would say like, well, let's walk through their shoes, like step by step. How would this happen? What do they need? And the other reason is sometimes business leaders, well, I'm afraid to like publish all the profiles because I don't want people to reverse engineer my organizational chart, this or that. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, kind of like, that's not really what's most important. So I think so much is just like, don't take convention, rethink it. I think that's what design has. Design is all about heart. Mm -hmm. It's about coming from a place of heart. And I think that especially now people want to know leaders have compassion. Because when you feel like you're at the mercy of leaders, especially in a crisis, you want to know that those people have compassion. And I think compassionate leadership is not even, it's not a trend. It's what we're going to need to get through this century because, because companies and in, in the challenges are, are I mean, the challenges today are global, global yeah. warming, right? Like, mm -hmm. like, like a pandemic, a pandemic does not know national borders. It unfortunately does not know borders. And so, so many of our challenges are global. Mm -hmm. Some of them are huge. And they're going to have a rapacious effect on people. And so I think that we're going to need to really lead, not just with our heads, but our hearts. And I think what happened is if you imagine having a head and a heart and your head has two sides, the left brain, and the right brain, what's happened in business is the heart was ripped out and half the head was ripped out. And so we have the like analytical part of the head. We don't have the creative part of the head. We don't have the heart, but everyone has all of these. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have to put the heart back into business. You have to put the creative part back in business. They just need to tolerate it. And if you do that, then suddenly it's like a wonderful marriage.
it's not even just a wonderful marriage. It's like a fully functioning system. Without without yeah. the creativity and the heart, you have a robot. I mean, well, you just have, you know, metrics yeah. and decision making by consensus and things like that. And I, I I think you're right. I see the industrial roots of that way of thinking, the, the factory. But then I also just recently did a deep dive looking into the success of how New Zealand responded to the pandemic. And so mm. much of that was Jacinda Ardern's compassionate leadership, clear communication, yeah. very transparent. And also with, I mean, her tagline was stay home, stay safe, be kind. And at the center of everything she was doing was an actual care for people's w- well-being. And you felt it. And so everybody f- sort of felt organically able to go along and be on board and um, coalesce into a group effort. I don't want to get too esoteric, but I do think when you're leading with conviction, when you have, you know, that energetic drive, and then you have this curiosity, which naturally makes you open to hearing other people's perspectives, um, to learning about who they are, to connecting with them, to learning new stuff. I think you're able to like create this sort of current that people are able to flow in more easily because they're not having to resist their own natural humanity. Exactly. And I think this is where people are going to be gravitating towards. I think you know, hate and totalitarianism can be um, contagious, but so can love and so can compassion and so can community and so can connection. And I, I think ultimately it will prevail because it is a fundamental need that everyone has. I want to ask you a personal question. You already described how you kept your shit together on a warp speed climb. Tried to. <laughs> or tried to. And, and I appreciate you sharing that. Because I do think that's something that it's not commonly talked about and it's hard to understand. So I appreciate you sharing that. But you also talked about like the danger of loneliness and isolation. And if you're not careful, fame, success, wealth, all of that can kind of contribute to having to be really protective, having to put up walls. How have you been able to maintain your needs, your connection and belonging and all of that, while also becoming probably, I don't know, an object of interest for a lot of people and and maybe even a target in a way. I have to tell you that I've not, I've certainly not mastered that. And I, like many people, experience threads of loneliness that kind of move throughout my life. And, um, you know, I had this perception kind of the more successful you get, the more things you accumulate, the more people are around you. Actually, all that's true, but it's possible to have so many people around you and still feel lonely. Mm-hmm. Um, loneliness is totally different than proximity, right? You can mm-hmm. be surrounded by people and you actually have to try really, really hard to stay connected, to maintain relationships and to be vulnerable and to still put yourself out there. And on the journey I've had now, I can now say with, with personal experience that um, having a certain amount of success and a certain amount of money, um, having been 26 being broke without living, you know, with just one friend in San Francisco, Joe, I can say that, you know, having more friends and more proximity to a point makes you happier. But then it's kind of like a bell curve. It kind of becomes asymptotic. It kind of stops. And then if you keep becoming more successful or you keep accumulating or become, you know, all these things. Mm -hmm. um, And again, I I say success in quotes because who the hell, who's to say what success is, but this is what society says success is. It has a way of isolating you. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a point, you know, and I, and I started realizing it a few years ago, like I would describe my own crisis of connection Mm. where I started realizing I was like really lonely and disconnected. And I didn't even realize it, right? I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't say at the time what it was. I was just feeling kind of anxiety and pressure and all this stuff happening. And it, it wasn't the, like people, like it wasn't the pressure that was hard. It wasn't the stress that was hard. It was the isolation and the disconnection and the like living a life that like, and you feel, you feel like your friends don't maybe understand what you're going through, but the people who do, there's not many of them and they don't seem like regular people either. And so I got to tell you, it's, it's a constant battle and you've got to push and work for it. And so what I try, I try to, I try to gravitate towards like just 
anything that's norm- normal. But normal to me is like, I just call it connection. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I think it's just, I think this is this crisis of connection. I think it is one of the crisis of our age. And I think there are other crises. I think we all talk about like global warming mm-hmm. and income inequality. There's, there's a lot of ones that, and I'm not suggesting this is more important or anything. This is just a subtler one. You know, I just, I'll just give you an example. Like the former surgeon general in the United States under Barack Obama was a guy named Dr. Vivek Murthy. And he came, became the surgeon general in the United States. And they asked him what his signature issue was going to be. And he thought his signature issue was going to either be obesity or the opi- opioid addiction. These are like obviously huge killers in America, right? Mm-hmm. And he started, before I pick an issue, I'm going to tour around the country and do a l- listening sessions. So he basically met with Americans all over the country. Americans that had opioid addiction or depression or anxiety or heart disease or diabetes, all sorts of, of crises. Mm-hmm. And something occurred to him. He noticed that there were many things in common with all these people. There was something else underlying them. And it was this idea of loneliness and disconnection. And there was a study that showed that if you're lonely, it's equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day as far as what it can do to your life expectancy. Mm -hmm. And this was profound to him. And so he basically proclaimed that the number one killer in America is loneliness. And this is before the pandemic. He ended up writing a book about this. And I became interested in this subject just because of what we do. Like, I was like, well, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is kind of help connect people. Whether we do it or not successfully, that's the ultimate goal of what we're trying to do. And Mm -hmm. we're not here to solve the problem. We just want to be useful to this problem. And I think this is before the pandemic. And so I think before the pandemic, I think if you told people this is a huge problem in the world, I don't think they would have maybe it would have resonated. I think we all now can just consciously relate to it. And I think the challenge is now with the pandemic, so many things are getting digitized and they're going to be accelerating. Right. So many restaurants aren't coming back. And so our Mm -hmm. food's going to just show up on our front door and we're going to end up potentially there's a risk that we could live in this isolated existence. But again, I'm an optimist. And I'm an optimist because I know that the world we're living in is one we designed. And I know that therefore, if we don't like it, we can just change it. Yes. If you don't like a design, just change it. Yes. And so we can actually design the world that we want to live in. Why the hell can't we? Someone else designed the world we're in now. Right. Why wouldn't we just design a different world? Sing it. And I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't mean to say that like like any one of us, but like if just people collectively, that's 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 what's going to happen. Yes. So either the world, we can design the world we want to live in or we'll design it for us. And you know what? There's millions of designers and they're, they're not all going to do it individually, but every one of these things has got to be part of a broader conscious design. Mm-hmm. And I really do hope that we design with this in mind, among other things. And, and I, I think we can. I know we can. I know we can. Yeah. I think one of the huge barriers is changing cultural opinion and helping people see that everything around them is designed and therefore... If, you know, these making these conscious design choices about the world that we want to live in is the way forward. Yeah, yeah, totally. What's going on in your life right now? How are you meeting and reckoning with the current state of the world? Personally, I mean, you know, I mean, I know you have a company to run, but. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, Well, I remember we were talking about kind of loneliness and something kind of significant happened in my life is I'll just kind of describe the last four or five months. So we spent like a decade building Airbnb. And this is an idea, Airbnb. I mean, I, I think my co-founder Joe was on this episode, so I won't tell the whole founding story. But just to give you like the, the whole story of Airbnb in like one minute, I was living with Joe in San Francisco. We couldn't afford to pay rent. An international design conference was coming to San Francisco. All the hotels were sold out. And that's been an idea one weekend. We said, what if we just turned our house into a bed and breakfast for the design conference? Unfortunately, Joe didn't have any beds, but we had three air beds. We pulled the air beds out of the closet. We inflated them and we called it airbedandbreakfast.com. We ended up hosting three people that weekend, three designers, Michael, Catherine, and Mole. And something remarkable happened. Beyond making uh, money, we actually got to meet really cool people and they ended up becoming friends with some of them. And so we ended up starting this company, Airbnb. And I remember telling um, somebody about the idea and I, and I, and he looks at me and he says, Brian. And I said, yes. And he said, I hope that's not the only idea you're working on. <laughs> Airbnb, people said the idea was crazy. Mm-hmm. It will never work. Strangers will never stay with other strangers in their homes. 
And so Airbnb, Silicon Valley is really good at laws of physics, not as good as at laws of human nature. And I felt like this was a, a fundamental law of human nature that actually contact between strangers is one of the things that's defined humanity and that it doesn't have to end badly. And so we ended up building Airbnb against all odds. It like kind of obviously took off. Mm -hmm. It became a noun of urban pop culture. We had 750 million guest arrivals. We had s customer sales. Um, the amount of money people spent on Airbnb was like greater than they spent in Starbucks. So it was like a huge thing. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're preparing to go public. This is 10 years later. I feel like, you know, we're, we're a very iconic Silicon Valley success. And all of a sudden, boom, mm -hmm. pandemic hits. It was like you're on a ship and there's a torpedo hits it. Mm. We spent 12 years building Airbnb. And then we lost 80% of our business in six weeks, 80%. And in that moment, it was just, I'm trying to think of even the word, describe it. You know, like when you rise fast, you can fall even faster. And it was really hard. But something else happened. People started reaching out to us, saying that they were supporting us, that people were rooting for us, that they still wanted Airbnb to exist. Um, and this is when all the, there were all these articles like, will Airbnb exist? And, you know, mm -hmm. can it survive? And there was, it was really only a couple months ago by the way. And I, and I started getting a lot of incredibly wonderful people reaching out to me, old friends, employees. When I started turning to the relationships that I had, like my co-founders, Joe and Nate, and, you know, over the course of 10 or 12 years, you kind of like, you all work on your things and we all get really busy and we do all these things. And sometimes you get so occupied that you don't have time for the very basics. Something about a crisis, I think it brought us back together. And we started talking it like so much more deeply about so many subjects and I started getting like much closer to other people just, 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 just out of like pure survival, right? Like, like you have to, cause you need each other to get through something. You learn a lot about yourself in a crisis. Yeah. And when we lost so much, I learned a few things. The first thing is sometimes you have to almost lose something to learn how much you love it. The second is that you learn a lot about other people in yourself in a crisis and you realize what's truly important and what your purpose is. And you get sometimes, not all the time, total clarity. And for us, our total clarity was like, we had to get Airbnb back to the roots of connection in human connection and belonging. Not, and it wasn't even about real estate or travel. It was about this more fundamental thing out of necessity, out of just ability to get to the next day, relations became even more important than ever because that's kind of at the end of the day it was almost the only things you have left and and then kind of like day by day we started i think kind of building Airbnb back up you know from the foundation from the relationships from this core idea you know i'm, I'm still in this i'm still like working out of my apartment or my house staring into an imac like every day you know working like 18 hours a day just trying to keep the company through this we have millions of people depending on us. And it's been the most defining period of my, my life, probably since we started Airbnb. And even starting Airbnb, it would be hard to rival this period. I also know that we all can get through this so long as we get through it together. And I think that like, no matter how isolating and lonely it feels, our perception that we're alone is mostly a perception that like we are actually much more connected than we perceive. And there are so many more people that love us than we realize in that very moment. And sometimes it takes a crisis to realize how much love and support you have around you. But you don't need that crisis if you can just open your eyes and see what you have and just reach out. Think of all the people around you that love you and are you talking to them? And now's a really good time. And you're like, I don't need to do that. If you did, you'd probably feel a lot better. And and, you, and, and that might be the antidote to what we're, all, what we're feeling right now. And, you know, our bubbles are getting smaller, but we can push against that. And I think that's really important. I think that's the most important thing. I think that's what this crisis is trying to teach us as, as a global society. We talk about essentials, right? Essential business, like as if like it's something that comes in a cardboard box to our front door. Well, yeah. That's, that's also essential. <laughs> there are some essential things. But there are some like even more fundamental essentials that I think it's important to remember. Yeah. I mean, it's that hierarchy of needs, right? It's, um, yeah. as your doctor said, fundamental lack of connection is the highest cause of death. Yeah. It's like, it's like the root cause of so many other preventable diseases. 
addiction, depression, anxiety, obesity. Uh, it's it's not it's not a cause of all of that, but if you reverse engineer many of those causes, it has roots in these other problems. And then you ask, well, how do we even get there? Well, because we inadvertently, collectively designed a world that disconnected us, and we all did it together. And if we did it together, we can fix it together. And we just need to be first of all conscious that even happened, and then we got to try to design something different. You talked about zooming out, design the room, design the neighborhood that the room lives in. Have you done this with your own life? Like, have you zoomed out and thought about the life that you want to be living in 10 years, in 40 years? That's a very good question. Like, you made a choice when you were 17 to be happy. I chose that, yeah, yes. And I love what I do. I love the work. I guess the thing has been like, everything has changed so quickly that the personal part of it's been more disorienting than the, 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 the professional part. Cause like you're making something and the thing you make just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and you see it grow uh, But to this point. So much of my focus has been on Airbnb. You know, when you start a company, I, I guess you probably feel like this, like you're almost like a parent and the company's like your child. And so it's normal to, to focus so much your energy on like the thing you're creating and that's kind of where a lot of my tension has been. And I, I think that's a story a lot of people share when they, they make something. And especially when it, it gets a lot of momentum. Yeah. But I mean, kids grow up and go away to college <laughs> and eventually yes. parents become empty nesters. You know, I think that's maybe what some of this has been for many of us has just been a, a, a moment of reflection, right? Yeah. And like, yeah. Like, like what kind of, what kind of life do you want to live and who do you want to be? And I'm sure like many people, I'm, just certainly think about that kind of stuff. One thing that's like super clear to me is again, just go keep going back to is just the value of the people in your life. That is so important. We are the accumulation of our relationships and our experiences. Yeah. Probably as much as anything, right? And and I think it's very easy to say, well, the accumulation of all the stuff we have in life, but we're probably more the accumulation of our experiences and our relationships, probably more than anything. Well, I think our relationships our mirrors and we ultimately evolve and grow through our relationships, but our stuff is just stuff. We it's baggage. It is kind of interesting, right? Like we came from a society that had a lot of relationships and not a lot of stuff. And so then we basically created this industrial world that allowed us to create so much more stuff. And now it's kind of tipped that we have so much stuff and so many tools and you know, what we need aren't just more tools and more stuff, but we need to kind of get back some of the stuff that we traded it in for a little bit. And just through our time, our energy, maybe this crisis is in some ways like a great awakening on some of this stuff. I think so. Yeah. Well, hopefully that was <laughs> even more existential. Jeez, I keep, I keep falling into an existential trap. I, well, I keep I setting you up for it. Like, let's just talk, yeah, yeah. Let's just talk about like movies. And I go, well, film, what does it really mean? And I'm like, crap, I keep doing that. Well, before I let you go and we do a thank you, is there anything that you want to talk about? Anything, any project that's in the pipeline or anything for our listeners to keep an eye on that they might want to check out? One of the things we've wanted to do is when we said we wanted to get back to our to the roots of Airbnb and we talked about getting back to the roots of community and all that. The other thing that Joe and I talked about is getting back to the roots of design because Airbnb was started by three people and two of them were designers. And I really want to like use design to like bring the creative spirit to our product. And so I think one of the things I'm super excited about are our experiences product. We have these, I mean, most people know me for homes and you can get a home anywhere in the world. Um, but we also realize the biggest um, asset in people's life really is not their home. It's their time. And many people have time, they have passions, they want to share with other people. And so, you know, what if you could like allow somebody to like book an experience having like with another person or a group of people, we have like chefs who do like kind of cooking classes and we have like, our history professors doing like kind of education experiences. We have 200 Olympians that right now in Airbnb are on offering experiences online. Like I did an experience last week with this, it's past week with this uh, 1988 gold medalist, Jackie Joyner Kersey. She was the, wow. the, she was heptathlete and sports illustrated, I think named her like the best female athlete of the 20th century or something. 
you can actually have these like really cool experiences of people. And so, you know, so much of what we're trying to do is like not just find a ways to provide housing for people, although that's very important. Talk about the, the pyramid of needs, but also kind of work our way up the pyramid and kind of find some other ways to connect people and help people like get a glimpse into other people's worlds um, and maybe inspire more curiosity about a little bit more curiosity about people and cultures through common interest, right? And so that's one of the things we're trying to do. So we have experiences, we have online experiences, and I think that they'll be one of the really important things that we're going to be offering in the future. And yeah, if you ever want to learn any kind of passion, the difference between our experiences and others is they're just really interactive, right? They're small, you participate at six to eight people. So hopefully it's a way to like actually connect not just passively view something like, you know, kind of like on YouTube or Instagram. Right. So that's, that's kind of the core theory there that there's many influencers on Instagram. There's many people doing videos on YouTube, but you just don't interact with them. You don't meet them. They don't know you exist and you can't meet other people on them. And so what if you could actually interact with people and connect? And so that's one of the things we're trying to do. And we're going to also come up with other ways to like, for people to find connection as well. So we have, these homes, obviously, most a lot of people know them. Experiences, not as many people know them. But we want to come up with some other ways. And I think over the next year, hopefully, you'll see some new things that we'll, we'll offer. And hopefully, people can stay tuned because I, I think we can launch some really cool stuff. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what we're focused on now. I love it. Thank you so much. This has been so gratifying. It just end where we started. I'm being interviewed by somebody I went to college with following you interviewing somebody I went to high school with. Like if there was ever like um, the universe telling you something, you know, that <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was meant to be, it was totally meant to be. Hey, thanks for listening to see images of Brian and his work and read the show notes. Click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app, or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or actually wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would, please do us a favor and rate and review. Man, does that help us out. We also love chatting with you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Clever is produced by 2VDE Media, with editing by Rich Straffolino, production assistance from Laura Jaramillo, and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.